What are you optimistic about now? One is a sense of history. The more I think about the future, the more I read about history, the more I know about the history, the more I'm convinced that progress is real. And all the ingredients that we have for progress are still present. So statistically, it's going to continue. The progress will continue. It could stop tomorrow, but it's just unlikely to because all the ingredients for progress in the past are still present going forward. The second source of my optimism is going back to this idea that of trusting strangers. And I think what optimism you're doing, you're trusting the future. You're trusting that it's not that our problems are fewer and smaller than we think they are. It's that our capacity to solve problems is greater than we thought and increasing faster than our, our abilities to make problems. So, so if we can create 1% more than we destroy every year, that 1% difference, even if a half a percent difference is compounded over time. So even a tiny 1% a half percent difference, which is not visible. You can't see it. Right. You look around, you see all this crap and terrible and harm and stuff, but all we need is 1% more good than bad. And that 1% is sufficient over time. So yeah, I can easily agree to the huge amount of terrible stuff in the world, but all I need is 1% more good and I can be optimistic. This isn't your average business podcast and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Probably even more than that. Um, I, I would say it's probably at least seven or eight years ago. You look that exactly the same except you have more hair. Yeah. And I have less hair. Well, I have grayer hair and I have facial hair. So <laughs> and I have less hair. <laughs> well, how how have you been doing? I mean, obviously I'm I'm reading your book or I read your book, Excellent Advice for a Living, and there's so much I want to talk to you about, but how's it going? It's going great. It really is fantastic. I'm having a ball. Um and I am um you know making art every day. That's that's a big thing. What uh, kind of art are you making? Well, for a year, I posted something every day that I made by hand on an iPad. This year, I'm co-creating it with AI every day. And um, so I have, a, I have an assistant, an intern, and that intern is, um, an intern and I are making art, and it's, I'm trying to surprise myself. That's my, main, that's my main motivation in making art, is I have no idea what we're gonna, what we're gonna do. I'm gonna sit down, and then I'm gonna surprise myself with something. And so my, I kind of go where, where it leads me in the most surprising direction. Well, let me ask you about that because I'm a writer. I've written uh, several books and you've been a writer for, for decades. You've been an inspiration to, to all writers. And what's a way you've surprised yourself in writing? And that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, here's the thing about me in writing is I don't like to write. I like having written. And I think that's true for every writer, by the way, because well, the, writing is very unnatural. There, there, are, there are some. I, I worked at Wired, and I hired, you know, worked with writers like Neil Stevenson, who love to write. This is this is their their their, their relaxed state. They're just they're just generating words, and they just love that. I am the opposite, and, and the hardest thing for me is that is that first draft. And when I sit down, I don't sit down with ideas in my head that I have to get onto the page. I don't have any ideas. The ideas come to me through the act of writing. So writing is how I think because I don't have the ideas before I sit down. So I sit down and that act of forcing myself to put words on the page generates the ideas. And so um, that's, so when I'm sitting down, I'm surprised. It's like, I didn't know that I thought that. And that's why I'm writing. I'm writing to figure out what I think. What, what makes you sit down to write? Is it a deadline or have you, or do you just do it? Um, I, I kind of need, well, both work. So I sometimes will take assignments and, and suggest things to Wired very kind of cautiously because then I have a deadline and that will force me to to produce stuff. So um, the common thing is I, I like say early days of AI and these image generators, I like I thought there's something really, really important here. I don't know what I think about it. I'll pitch a story to Wired, I'll get an assignment and then I have to force myself to write it and that's then I'll, I'll conclude with knowing what I think about it. So I will sort of give myself a deadline in the sense of taking an assignment. Other times, like for my blog, it's I'll start to have an idea 
And I'm saying, I think there's something there. I think it's important. And so I will give myself a kind of a mini deal. I'm going to produce something today and whatever I'll write as much as I can figure out today. It's just a blog. And then I'll publish that. And so um, it's a way, it's how I think. You know, you've written so many things that have become part of kind of the almost cultural identity, particularly of the tech world. Like, you know, still, I mean, I was just talking to you the other day, someone mentioned to me the concept of someone, there's this idea of a thousand true fans. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yes. Kevin Kelly, he's been yeah. on my podcast. But it's really true. I mean, there's entire industries now developed around marketing in terms of funneling a large audience down to the, yeah. you know, thousand true fans. And it works. If you have a thousand true fans, those are the people who will make you a living and yeah. because you're providing something of such incredible value to them. And your book, Excellent Advice for a Living, contains so many thousand true fan style pieces of advice. There's another thing. I think it's you who said um, that better to be the only than the best. Is yeah. that is that yeah. you? Yeah, that's me. Well, uh, and again, I don't think I'm the first to say that. But um, I might be the first to say exactly this way, which is don't aim to be the best. Aim to be the only. And so um, that is sort of my – that's a bit, bit of advice that I wished I had heard earlier in my life because it would have really clarified things. And it took me kind of a long time to get there. And it was actually through Wired and trying to make uh, writing assignments, as we were just talking about, to other writers that, that I came to this conclusion. And that was, um, you know, as an editor at Wired, we'd have story ideas. And we'd try to find a writer to write the story. And I would pitch stories at these story meetings and and some some of my ideas are like, no, that's that's not a good idea, or yeah, so what? And so I would say, okay, that's a stupid idea, kill that one. But the idea would come back to me maybe a year later, and say, you know, that, I, I really like this idea. I think this is good. We should we should do this. And eh, people would say, no, nah, I don't think so. It would get no votes. Okay, so kill that idea, and then maybe come back a third time, and you know, I, I really think this is a good idea. Um, but no one else would, 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 would think it's a good idea. So then I, would, then I had this realization, oh, oh, I have to write this one hmm. because I'm the only one who, who, who thinks this is good. I'm probably the only one who can do it. I've been trying to give away the idea. No one else is going to do it. So I would do it, and that would be my best piece. And it was what, just like, the, of like, oh, that's why I'm here. And so a lot of people think that the career-wise – that what you want to get to is a place where you're doing something that you love, you're doing something you're really good at, and you're doing something that other people find valuable to pay for you for. And that's the kind of holy trinity, the Venn diagram with those overlapping right. circles. But there's a fourth state. And that fourth state is like, yeah, if that, 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 those are kind of the minimum requirements. But it's also like, can anybody else do this? Is, is this can I outsource this? Is this something that someone else could do? Because then... I'm not really the person who should be doing it. And so that's the question I ask these days is not just, am I good at it? Would it be fun? Would I get paid for it? It's like, can anybody else do it? Because if someone else could do it, I want to give it to them. And I want to only wind up doing the things that only I can do. And so, um, because when I'm doing them, those are things, I don't have to worry about competitors. I've been trying to give it away the idea. I don't have to look over my shoulder. I'm not in a hurry because no one else is going to do this. And um, it's easier. It's, it's, I'm, it's going to be, I'm going to be at ease with it because nobody else can do it. And so, so I'm aiming for, for those things. And I wish I was aiming for them when I was younger, where you're kind of like, you know, it's the thing that you are, doing which so you don't need a resume so you know it could be your brand all those kinds of things are also put into play and so that's one of the criteria that i use right now for deciding what to do next you know it's it, there's so much to unpack in this for, for one thing it could be that you're the only because quite correctly everyone else refused to do it and yeah. so you have, kind of have to be the only you have to kind of experiment quite a bit 
to yeah. find the only that really stands out. But yeah, you can't be the only sucker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 often that's happened to me where someone calls and says something like, oh, you've got to invest in this where, I don't know, creating wireless all through Africa and Bill Clinton's going to invest in the second round, but we're just closing the first round and we need you. And I start to, th I, at first I'm excited, but then I start to think, is Bill Clinton really sitting by the phone waiting to find out if I've invested yet? Right, exactly. <laughs> like, that's not happening. Right. So, but the other thing to unpack there is, like you mentioned, Neil Stevenson's a great writer and you're a great writer, but I can't, nobody can tell which writer is 10% better than another writer. But you can tell with like Neil Stevenson or William Gibson, oh, these guys invented an entire genre of writing. They're different. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if Neil Gibson or Neil Stevenson is better than Ernest Hemingway. I have no clue. I can't, right, right. there's no metrics to judge. But I do know he did something really different from every other writer, including every other science fiction writer. And that's why we know yeah. Neil Stevenson. Right, right. And, and so the, w one of the, 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 the downsides to chasing the best is that that's sort of an occupied, that's kind of usually occupied right now um, niche. So if you want to become, you know, the world's best basketball player, you're, it's great competition. I mean, it's intense competition. There's a very limited number of, of people in that movie. And so uh, it's really hard, but what you want to be kind of is, you know, the best in something that there's probably no name for. And that's one of the, my bits of uh, advice in the book for a young person is, or even for a startup or for a corporation or a company, which is try to work at a, in an area where there's no words, no name for what it is that you do. And where it takes a long time to kind of explain to your mother and father what it is that you're, you're working on, because that is meaning that you're much more likely to kind of be in that territory of the only rather than the best. And, and you're much more likely to be able to, um, be at an area where there's going to be a breakthrough because that's where the breakthroughs happen. They, 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 they break through that area where there's really no language right now. And you, I, there's a lot of ways to kind of, I guess, figure out what is the only, and uh, you mentioned in this book, uh, you know, being enthusiastic about something raises your IQ 25 points, <laughs> which is really true because your focus, if you're enthusiastic or obsessed, your focus while you're learning becomes so much more intense. You're going to learn, you're going to pick up so many more nuances than someone who's just not really that interested. And that's one way to be the only, right? And it seems like another way to be the only is to be the best at an intersection of a bunch of areas. Yeah. So for instance, I'm never going to be the, you, Kevin Kelly is, are, you're never going to be the best basketball player in the world, right? but you might be the best 68 year old basketball player, or you might be the best combination of 68 years old, Basketball player, hockey player, and baseball player. Like right. you get intersections. Uh, right. Or you could be something like the Globetrotters, which is the, uh, you're a basketball comedian. Um, or yeah. you're, or you're, you become, you know, the first um, basketball podcast uh, announcer. Or, I mean, there's just, you, you could combine, as you said, you could combine these. You could, you could take a different tack. So, but the thing is that you're going to be, you're going to aim for, you want to drift towards something being the only. Um, and, and there are basketball players who become the only in the sense of their style of play or whatever. But the point is, is that you want to kind of, if, if at all possible, uh, make you define success your way. You kind of create your own definition of success. And if you are taking something, you know, an accountant or, or, or something off the shelf, that's so hard to, to, to really rise to the top because as right. I said, Everybody else, or there's millions of other people kind of on that same track. So um, find your own track. And that seems cliche, but it um, uh, it really does work. And, and, and by the way, this will take most of us, including me, most of our lives to kind of even head in that direction that you never really arrive. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a direction rather than a destination. And, but, but kind of getting there is not, it's a high bar. It's not easy. And, and, and the other thing I say about it is that you can't do this alone. It, it's, it's really paradoxical that in order to be the most unique you, you need everybody else to help you. <laughs> you, you need everyone else around you, your, your family, your friends, your acquaintances, colleagues, clients and customers to kind of help you see who you should become or are becoming and, um, become the only, 
um, that's a collective effort in order to make a unique individual. I mean, I, I sort of look at you and I see you're the, the only in terms of you've really stood out as a source of wisdom, particularly in the tech world for decades, not just like last year or this year, or you have something to say about AI, but for decades, you've been kind of preaching this message that goes beyond what's the latest Apple earnings, what's my review of the latest product and so on. You really kind of try to determine what peak performance is in this in this arena. But let me ask you, what if the people around you didn't support you? What if your wife or kids or colleagues weren't really big? F you realized all of a sudden they weren't fans of the Kevin Kelly you were becoming. Right, right. So so, so um, th that's a really fair question. And I, and I would say m my approach would be, um, I think I, I, there's another piece of advice like, you know, to, um, uh, you know, to kind of like, get rich, you want to try and succeed to get really wealthy, you want other you want to help other people succeed. And so one of the things I would say to do is, is to kind of your job becomes to help the people around you help you. And mm -hmm. how do you help other people around you to help you is is you you want to help them to succeed. And as they succeed, they are more capable of helping you succeed. And so that is a really powerful advice, actually. Yeah. So, so, so you're going to say, so, so it's like, yeah, you're not really supporting me, but I'm going to support you. And, and, and this, this comes back to the kind of the weirdest paradox in the universe, which is fundamentally at, at its core, which is the more you give, the more you get. I mean, this mathematically makes no sense at all, right? That the more you give away, the more you get. It's, it's someone recently said, like, it, the most, the most um, selfish thing you can do is to give things away, right? It, I mean, it, that, that, that doesn't make any sense at all, but that is just sort of so fundamental. And so that's what you begin to do with the people around you is, is you start to give to them and then they are able to, they'll send it back to you to help you find your way. It, it, it's so interesting because having experienced many ups and downs over the past few decades, as I'm sure you have as well, I find when I'm most down at a down point, it's really hard to yeah. think about helping others because you're so consumed with right. the potential disasters in your mind. Right. And, and that's, but you know that when you do, it's, it, it returns, uh, um, you know, returns yields on unbelievable yields. And so, um, and that's usually the turning point for most people is, 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 is um, turning from that inward focus to outward and the moment that happens, things begin to change. And so it's hard, as you said, if you're hurting, you're in pain, suffering, um, those tend to, to bring your mind inward and it becomes difficult to do it. But if you're, when you're capable, when you're able to for those moments, um, you can see that there is, that that's the solution is to flip it around. Well, what's an example from your life? So, um, <clears throat> um, I, you know, I learned some of these things, um, hitchhiking, um, hitchhiking where, um, even though I'm asking for a favor, um, it's really, it's really about the other person picking up. They have, they're, they're after something they're looking for. And, and so the, uh, the, 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 I'm turning, I turn hitchhiking around. It's like, I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you an opportunity to, uh, to have a conversation. I want to listen to you. I'm going to listen to you. You can, you can listen to me. I'll tell you a story. And, um, uh, and, and then I'm being vulnerable, uh, because I'm out there saying, yeah, I'm, I'm alone. Here is, you can pick me up. Who knows what will happen? Um, but I'm going to receive, I'm going to receive from you. I'm going to receive your gift of a ride. And, and in return, um, we'll get, you'll, we'll share something. And so there was, there was this, 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 I mean, believe it or not, hitchhiking is sort of, um, is very outward focus in, in, in a weird sort of way. And, um, uh, I was, I did that enough to, to see the, the power of like being vulnerable, of, of, of being able to receive things. And of, of being able to, 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 to kind of give in, re in reciprocation to people that 
I would normally not even interact with or not even like, whatever it is, um, that was that was something that taught me about this sort of flipping things around. It, you know, it's interesting. You just you just brought back a wave of memories of when I was younger, and I used to hitchhike quite a bit in in the city I lived in. In fact, I used to race my friends. I would bet them I can get yeah. to someplace faster by hitchhiking. But you're right. Someone picks you up because for a few minutes they want a friend. Yeah. And and the one piece of advice I always give people who who hitchhike is make sure you don't slam the door. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, the everybody other, hates when you slam the door. Yeah, I used to hitchhike to work every day. It was so reliable. And um, I, I hitchhiked away from work. <laughs> and uh, uh, my piece of advice about hitchhiking is: um, uh, look like the kind of people that you want you to pick up, that you want you want yeah. to pick you up. So, like, that's you know, your look. Like, yeah, m m mirror their look. Um, I haven't yet. <laughs> well, there, were, there was a guy who was uh, hitchhiking in a suit, which I thought was just totally brilliant. Um, <laughs> I haven't quite done that yet. Um, so, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, part, part, a thing that runs through my book, uh, and, and by the way, that's, that is more of me as an only is I, I've become deliberately more optimistic as I get older, more and more optimistic. That, that, that is what runs through the book is a sense of optimism and generosity. Yeah. I think those are, are very, very related as, as kind of the foundational stance that, I, I've come to to not believe the story that we tell ourselves that the basic human instinct is selfishness. I think it's the opposite. I think the basic human instinct, when all things are equal, is is to share, is to help. And um, I, I've just seen that around the world, and that's just how the world works. And if you are, um, if you trust strangers, I think that that is my default. Is I am going to haven't met you before, but I'm going to totally trust you unless you give me evidence otherwise as the, as the default. And occasionally, sure, I may get cheated because of that trust, but I consider that a tax on the incredible benefits I get by trusting strangers because they give me their best when I trust them. And so and compared to the benefits that I've, that you'll get when you trust others, getting cheated every now and then is just a little tiny tax that I willingly pay. You know, and you know, a lot of this advice, like take the advice about hitchhiking, this applies really to more than just hitchhiking. I, hitchhiking is almost a metaphor, right. but uh, like if you're trying to sell your company, even if you're talking about billions of dollars of, of value, ultimately someone wants to buy your company because they want to, they want you as a friend closer to them. Yes. They want you in the office next to them so they can hang out with you. Yes, it's very, very human, very social, and and, and that's something else that I kind of you know being involved in some startups and, and my own business over time is is that um, I've come really to see that businesses are extensions of the personalities of the founders. I mean, they're they're they're, they're a way to kind of amplify their personality, and they do amplify their personality, and that's an, an, why I have another bit of advice, which is um, don't ever work for somebody that you don't want to become, right? Because you will, if, if you're if, if you're working for someone that kind of a, a founder that has this vision and it's, it's someone you don't want to be, it's like, don't work for them because you are kind of participating in their expression and you'll become more like them um, as you work around people. So you, you do want to choose it when you have a choice. Family, you don't have a choice. But where you work and colleagues, these are under your control and you want to associate yourself with people who help you on your path to being the only. You know, you mentioned in the book, um, most overnight successes take at least five years. Yeah. And I agree with that. Can you can you outline a little bit those five years? Like what's year one look like? What's year two look like? And so on. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, um, that that's a, that's a one way that I kind of do my uh, life accounting, meaning like, okay, I am 71. You know, at the very, very best, you know, let's say I can make it to a hundred. So that's 30 years. And so that's six, I have six more projects I can do in my life at the best. And that's assuming that I can do any kind of project from between 95 and a hundred, but and you can count them off. And that's a really good way to kind of think about your life. You know, I have this countdown clock that um, Matt Groening um, used in, um, in Futurama of uh, on my computer about how many days I have left. And, um, 
what it took was the actuarial tables for someone born my age and male, et cetera, in America. And statistically, my lifespan left and turned it into days and then put it into a clock, which shows up. It says, okay, I have 5,862 days left. And man, that is really, really sobering and clarifying. So I like to think in terms of days and five-year blocks. So I have, you know, 5,000 something days to do um, whatever I'm going to do. And, um, you know, the five-year things, because and there's five years. And so the five years is an accounted from the moment you first have the idea and maybe sketching it and making notebook ideas to the, the day that you stop thinking about it. That's, that's my, that's the, the limits. And so the first initial part of it is just kind of noodling, thinking, trying to decide whether this is a good idea, whether you really want to do it, what the consequences would be, maybe trying to imagine it. And I believe, and that's another piece of advice in the book, in prototyping. Prototype your life instead of making grand plans. Prototype everything. So I made, this is the book, and I made prototype versions of the book that are bound mm -hmm and different wow. versions of it as I went along imagining and designing the book. And I do that with all my books um, at different stages, make, make prototypes. And I do that with anything I make or design is like in the kitchen remodel, we did a prototype of full scale cardboard. You get refrigerator cardboards boxes and you make a full scale prototype of, of it to, to see what it looks like in real life, to see what it feels like. So you can make those adjustments. And when I make things, I make a prototype version of it, knowing that I'm going to throw it away. You know, there's just a, a step on the way. And so that's, a, that's, for me, the second year kind of is, or at least the second latter half of the first year is, is prototyping stage, where I'm kind of still exploring. I can tell really whether it's going to work or not, and, and, and still trying to see whether it's, I'm committing to it or not. And then, and then once I'm going further, I'll prototype again the next stages, maybe to see whether there's more people that want to be involved, whether it's what the scale of this thing is, um, take kind of the next step. And um, I, I usually try to have one person involved because I, I find that it helps me move things forward. It's like um, there's kind of accountability maybe a little bit in that. So, so like with this book, did you have like an editor you would – throw ideas against or yeah uh, so um i had an early reader uh hugh howie oh i love you uh, hugh is great and so he hugh was was kind of urging on and he was giving advice and uh, i was sharing things with him and um yeah i mean he gets a little credit in the book because um he was that he was that accountability kind of uh, of factor and how, how did you meet Hugh, by the way But by the way, shout out to Hugh Howie, May 5th. I'm so looking forward to the science fiction series. Yes. Uh, Silo coming Silo out. Coming up. Plus, based on his great series of self-published novels called Wool. Fantastic. Fantastic yeah. writer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Hugh has a fantastic story about how he was, you know, working in a bookstore and, you know, um, made his success by writing chapters and publishing them on Amazon singles, um, self-publishing. Um, so I met Hugh, I think, at... Um, uh, maybe a Ted Banff gathering. He was there. Um, he was really good at um, becoming friends to everybody, right? <laughs> he, he, once you know Hugh, he's your lifelong friend, and he's really good and really works hard at being a friend. So I met him briefly, and, you know, we've been friends. We've done some great walks together. Um, he's, you know, he comes by, stays at our house. So it's really... So, so it's, I, I would give it all to Hugh, who is a, just a fantastic professional friend in many ways, because I know that he has lots of friends throughout the world, because he really works at it. He, he takes it very seriously. And I think that's another skill that you can have is the skill of being a friend. I feel like I need to be better at that skill. I feel like it's very hard for me to keep in touch with people. Why is that? I don't know. I get just caught up in my own activities and then I just don't call people to say, Hey, how are you doing? Right. And, and I agree with the advice in your book. 
like I'm never very transactional either. Like I really like being friends with people and I'm not transactional, but it's just hard for me to pick up the phone and, and check in with people. Yeah. One of the things that I'm, I'm doing, taking my own advice is that, um, you know, uh, I advise don't, don't withhold your praise and compliments to someone until their eulogy, until they're gone. <laughs> it's always really bizarre. You know, people say the most fantastic things about people at their funeral. It's like, why don't we say those things to their, while they're alive? When they can enjoy it. Well, you, well, usually because they're lying at the funeral, but let's say setting that aside. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> but, but actually, yeah, you, you have as advice in the book um, to, to earn bliss for just a moment, uh, find someone you a barely know or don't know and give them a compliment. Yeah, yeah, or, or thank a teacher that, that helped you. Um, yes, uh, that is true. And the other piece of advice is, is you should attend as many funerals as you can. And listen to what people say because, and, and I unfortunately have that um, <laughs> have that opportunity more and more often these days um, as I get older. But if you listen to what people say, they almost never talk about that person's achievements. What they talk about is how that person made them feel, what kind of a person they were while they were achieving, what what you know what they were about, and um, that's very sobering. It's very, very sobering. Um, and, and, and so it's, uh, so I try to keep that in mind, um, with people and, um, not just asking how they're doing, but, but, um, uh, see if I could be of help. There's there yeah. a great piece of advice for our kids, which is instead of asking them, um, what did you learn today at school? You say, uh, who did you help today at school? Yeah, I like that. Now, you know, speaking of kids, you said in part the inspiration for writing this book was uh, you're writing advice to your children. And, yeah. the, and you wrote 68 pieces of advice and, and they wanted much more. So you ended up yeah. writing 450 pieces of advice. Yeah. Do you think they, do you think they follow your advice? Well, so 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 um, our, my, I have three adult, uh, three kids and they're now um, young adults. And um we were the opposite of, of helicopter parents. We, we I don't know what the opposite is. It's like not feral. We were not absent, but we really um, did not give them a lot of advice. What? Because I think the kids don't listen to what parents say. They just watch what you do. So we tried to give our advice by modeling it. And um, so I gave, you know, I asked my son when he's, after I gave him uh, the copy of the book just the other day. And uh, he said, yeah, you're, yeah, I have never heard you say these things, but you did teach them to us. Hmm. And I thought, okay, that worked. Um, and, and, you know, th th there was an ex there's a very kind of um, trivial example. So um, neither my wife or I swear. Just That's just sort of how we were. We just have never, just never swear. We never had a single conversation about swearing in our family. Never once was there anything about this is what we say, don't say, this is language. This is, I mean, or even talked about it. There was never, it was simply never a topic. But none of my kids swear. Huh. You know, I didn't ever say, well, you, you know, you've got to be careful about this or I care about it. There was just simply, but they were just modeling that, that, that behavior. I think this is a very important thing for for parents to hear, like for me, whenever I've told my kids, you, you have to do this, this is the right way. And it's because of X, Y, Z, like I might be right, but they're just going to walk away and not listen to me. Yeah. Like, they're really going to model you. Live what you say. Yeah. If you say, if you say no phones at the table, but you have your phone, that this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, totally. uh, so, so yeah, we don't have phones or screens at tables, but we've never, said you can't have it is that we don't have them. They don't have them. Everybody leaves them away. So, so that's modeling. Um, the behavior is, is sort of how we did it. But so, but having said that, um, my, my son said, but there is, but, but he said, I did like the fact that they're written down because it, because I find them helpful. And so, and that's why I wrote them down originally was I, I think having this condensed version of them. So I spent most of my time trying to reduce these to a little tiny, encapsulated tweet size thing that you could repeat to yourself and that I could repeat to myself. So like a bit of advice, a practical advice is that if you, um, 
if you if I lost something in my household and and I can't remember where it is and I eventually find it, then when I'm putting it back, I repeat to myself, "Don't put it back where I f- found it. Put it back where I first looked for it." Ah, that's and interesting. That really works. Put it back where you first looked for it, and so that is changing my behavior. And so uh, because I can repeat that. Or another piece is is like you know if I'm invited to do something in six months from now, I always ask myself, um, "Would I do this if it was tomorrow morning?" Huh. All right. Would I do this if it was tomorrow morning? What well, What's an example of something where you was, you said no to? Oh, all the time. Um, like, uh, well, I mean, just I, mean, I get invited uh, every other day to, to to speak somewhere, and so I'm trying to decide, um, uh, like, okay, would I learn anything from this? You know, what's what's this? What's the situation? How much trouble it is? And I would, and I I literally ask myself, um, would I want to get on a plane tomorrow morning and do this? Um, and so I'll, I generally <laughs> say no, because I think I don't really don't want to do it tomorrow morning. I, I need to learn this as well. Like, I think when something's like a couple of months away, I almost always, and it seems exciting. I almost always say yes. And then as it gets closer, I'm like, Ugh, no, I, no, you I say, really don't want to do this. this tomorrow morning. What would I, would I, would I say yes to it? It really works. T- tell me about the rule of three in conversation. Yeah. You write about this in the book. I, I found this fascinating. There's two rules of three, but the rule of three in conversation is, um, and this came from Esther Perel, the the, the legendary um, yeah. marriage counselor, which is is that when you're having an con- intimate conversation and you're trying to kind of get to the bottom of something, you have to ask why or what's what, what's the story or what do you feel about it at three three rounds. So the first round of like, you know, tell me tell me what's going on, whatever it is, is kind of like the, I would say it's like the cover, it's like the cover story. And then you say, well, you know, um, you know, w- tell me what you really feel or what's really behind that or why you're doing that. Why? Because of the first one. And you hear another, another explanation, another level of, 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 of intimacy. And, but you really want need to stick around and press for the third level. Like, okay, really? Like, you know, I, I get that. That's why you're doing it. But, Tell me, tell me more. And when you get to the third level, that's very, very close to what the actual truth about the, the situation can, is. Can you give me an example? Well, if um, somebody's um, somebody that you know and love maybe is angry at you or something, and you can say, you know, what's what's going on, and there'll be some explanation about. Um, uh, Maybe something at work or whatever it is, but then you kind of go further and and it find out that that it's maybe um, something that um, there are uh, uh, that there's maybe a physical thing that's also prompting this that there's some level of a hurt or in, you know um, can't sleeping haven't been sleeping or I had couldn't sleep last night or last two nights and then there's if you press on it there's a third level of um, Maybe some a deeper anxiety that's you know behind the insomnia that's fundamentally worrying that's that's more crucial to the core of the person's being and that's usually kind of embarrassing to say initially on the first round so you have to kind of go through the process in a certain sense you have to earn a kind of a trust to be able to hear that true inner story. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I always I always say there's always a good reason and a real reason. Yeah. And 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 related to your rule of three, the the good reason is sort of just the cover story. Like I always give as an example, my daughter saying she wants to go to the library to study. So that's a good reason. But the real reason might be there's boys at the library. Right. And and or she wants to get away from you guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the other real reason. Um, you know. Uh, I, I love this one, and I ever, never really thought about this. And at any given point, we're always involved in different negotiations in our life. And you say the four most powerful words in any negotiation is, can you do better? And I wonder, like, let's say, let's say, you know, you're, you're applying for a job, you get a job, the boss offers you a salary. 
and and there, he has this big HR handbook, and this is the salaries for someone entering in at this level. So so he makes it seem like there's a formula. That's often also a powerful negotiating technique is to say, I can't do anything about it. It's the formula. Yeah. Um, but does can you? Is there any situation like when does can you do better? Do better than other times. You know, first of all, everybody knows that even the, the 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 even in situations where there's a handbook and stuff, they actually can negotiate. I mean, I mean that's that's the truth. Is is that is that um, if you if they want you bad enough, there is there is some room for negotiation all the time, and um, but obviously um, it works best when there are, when there aren't those kind of rules and where, 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 you know, where the, there's not a lot of comps. There's not a a lot of comparables from, you know, from houses to buying parts to all kinds of things. It's almost, I I would say that the the default is most of the times there is some wiggle room and it may not be very much, but as you said, can you do better? And usually the answer is yes. But it may not be very much. And those who are really good, and I'm not, I don't consider myself the ace negotiator, but those who are really good um, go through life and they, you know, you accumulate those little bits of, of, of differences and they can kind of, they can make a difference in aggregate. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even, yeah. even like, um, and, and it's really well known that all kinds of services from your, how much you pay for your, your phone to, you know, your Comcast to insurance there's actually far more room for negotiation in, than appears to most people. And um, it's most of us don't even bother with it because it is kind of a hassle to, to, to get into that negotiation. But even those kind of off the shelf um, sticker prices are usually there's, there's negotiations in them. Yeah. And it, it's interesting too. There's, there's multiple dimensions in negotiating. So it's not just always about money. Right. Can you do better? It might be about benefits or vacation or something you haven't even thought of. Right. 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 There was, there was a, fa- a pretty well known, I think it's either this American life or radio Lab. I think it was this American life um, episode on the good guy discount. Have you ever heard about that? No. <laughs> well, apparently, particularly in kind of the retail stores, there was this thing called the good guy discount that all you had to do is ask for the good guy discount and they would immediately give you like 10%. And so they were going around just trying that, just kind of walking into stores, buying a t-shirt or something and asking for the good guy discount. And like some percentage of it, maybe a third of the time, <clears throat> they were given the 10% discount. It was like, what? <laughs> there was this, it was like, just because they asked for it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I I remember negotiating um, even at my local uh, when I was a kid in high school, my little place where you buy the blue jeans, and there was like I found a, a, a kind of pair of Levi's or whatever with the right size and the right instrument because I'm kind of very short legs, and I bought. I said I like to buy four of these now because like for like future, you know, and uh, can you give me a discount? You know, like, can you do better? And even though they were, you know, they were marked, labeled the price tag, they negotiated. They gave me a bar. Yeah. And so, you know, earlier you referred to that you're doing art and with the, often with the assistance of AI. And on the whole, I'm very optimistic about AI and its potential for the economy and productivity and our artistry and, and so on. But as a writer, I sometimes wonder, is will AI, you know, learn enough about me, my style better than me. Like, and, and and this is related to don't be the best, be the only, how can one make sure they're the only, no matter how much AI improves? Right. So I have a recent bit of um, advice, which is in related to AI that, that what you want to do, I, I, I think a worthy aim in life is to try to become less predictable to such an extent, the AI won't be able to predict you and therefore replace you. So I like that. So, 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 I mean, that's what AIs are these days. They're basically <clears throat> autocomplete engines that are predicting the next word based on all the human, average human responses in the world. Um, and so, 
they're, they're what I call the universal personal intern because they're they're, they're, they're kind of wisdom of the crowd. They're, they're 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 trained on the average of all human input, and they make kind of the average human output. And you have to really kind of work with your digital intern to get them beyond that kind of mediocre middle. And that's what I think we're going to be doing with them. It's not that they, um, I have, I have lots to say about the AI, but one, they can't, there's lots of things they can't do even now based on the way that they're currently built. But what they're really good at in terms of becoming the only is that, um, they think differently than humans. They don't think like humans. The AI that they art that they make is weirdly little off. The stuff that they write, even though it's kind of like it, when it's predictable, the human is human average and not very useful if you want to become the owner because it's like it's the average of what everybody would say. And if you nudge them and trying to get them and work with them to get them off of that average, they tend to go in kind of ways that, that no human would go. And that's actually, in my eyes, their benefit, their chief attribute is because they aren't like humans and that we'll use them to help us think differently. So that's how people are using them nowadays as they generate some concepts. It's like no human would ever think of that. It's kind of weirdly inhuman and um, it's alien. It's what I call it the artificial aliens. And so that alienness is actually what we can use for ourselves as we make art to try and move us in kind of directions that we would not normally get to. And then we can try to make it our own. The, the reason why there was always going to be something, at least for this first generation, um, that they can't do is that I discovered this by trying to make art with them. There's a whole bunch of art that, that they can't get to. So theoretically, these engines can make any possible picture. That's you know the possibility space of images is huge and they can generate basically any possible image but they can't get to them because they have a language interface that's the big news with the ai it's not their ability to make images they can do that for years but now we have a conversational user interface we have this conversational interface with them that's the big bang that everybody's going crazy over is that you have a conversational interface to all kinds of things now including images but what it means is that they can only make images that can be described in language. And there's so much of human art that we make and the art that I've been trying to make that cannot be reduced to words. There's no words that are gonna get there. There's no description in language to get there. And because there isn't, these models can't make it. I've been trying to get them to make this kind of art, but I can't put it into words. And so therefore these, these image makers can't make it. And so there's lots that we do Music is one of them. They'll have AI generating music, but a lot of music cannot be described in words. Words. That's it's ephemeral. That's the that's the whole point of it. And so, we might make uh, continue to evolve new interfaces, or maybe more musical acoustic ways to work with it. But still, there's 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 parts of it that they cannot reach because the interface doesn't allow them to reach it. And so, oh, we oh, are still going to be involved. And I think the major stance and relationship that we want to have and understand with, with these artificial aliens is as partners for the most part. Most of the time, we're going to be partnering with them to curate stuff. They're not going to replace us. There are, there are partners. They need us. We need them. It's like in doctoring and medicine, you know, yes, right now, almost any human doctor is going to be better than an AI doctor. However, a human and AI team is better than both the AI by itself and the doctor by itself. And lastly, an AI doctor, not as good as a human doctor, but even an AI doctor alone is better than no doctor, which is what most of the people in the world would have. You know, it, it's interesting, you bring up music and they can't understand, let's say the text to describe music, but they can't, but if they're if they're learning on let's say Mozart sonatas right. the, that the language of of notes and chords and 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 so on they do under they do they can learn from that and so now ai can make a mozart sonata that experts can't tell is not a mozart sonata sure and 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 so if you want to make more mozarts yes you can do that that gets very boring after a while but if you want to make new music that you want to listen to um, they could, in theory, generate the music, 
but they're not going to arrive there because there's no, I mean, how do we tell them to get there? How do we tell them to, to do something? How do we, how do we correct it? So, so if they just do some random thing, anything done at random is going to be almost improbably worthless, right? That's, that's the improb. That's the you know, statistically, if you take a randomly generated book, it's going to be nonsense. And so, the 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 the, the issue is yes, they in theory could make any string of, of notes, but to work with them to get them to go somewhere that's really beautiful that we haven't been to, there's no interface for that because right, I mean, other than language or some earlier prompt of existing music. They can do something in between, but how do how do you get them to to fine tune that if you don't have a way to interface? So that's that's where we are. I, I think I say it's the first generation. It may be that as we go further, we can have better ways to interface them. But that is the the the, the thing is that we are we have intuition and all kinds of other things that are transcend language as as a means of what we're trying to do. Emotions, of course, and other things, but we don't. The AIs are ignorant of that in a certain sense. They 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 aren't capable of that transcendent ability yet. And so for the time being, for the time around, we are gonna work with them to produce something the equivalent of Mozart. We they need us, we need them to get there. You know, you mentioned earlier that as you get older, you've gotten more optimistic. Yeah. And I with with myself, I feel particularly recently, I've gotten a bit more pessimistic, like things are a little bit more, even though, even though, you know, as Mark Twain says, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And so you can say, okay, this has happened more or less before. I feel like things are more uncertain now yeah. than ever before. Yes. And that scares me a little bit, yeah. even though I know things have been worse before, like, you know, we've had Vietnam, we've had the civil war, we've had you know, horrible, you know, we've had horrible things happen around the world and in this country and to ourselves personally, but lately somehow the uncertainty has, has unnerved me. Yeah. What, what's your source of, op, what are you optimistic about now? You're right. There, the, first of all, I, I, I think that is, I was just having this conversation yesterday with somebody who's pretty high up in the tech stack, we might say. And um, the, the, there is a sense in which there is, I would say greater uncertainty and, and, um, you know, just because of the speed at which things are moving, the way that we're moving into new territory, there, there is a sense in which, you know, we really haven't been here before. This is really new territory and that is an uncertainty. And then you have the speed of change that, that, that kind of like saying, well, what I used to know may not really apply. I'm not really sure if it does. So, um, how can I be optimistic in this? Well, I, I, I think, Couple sources of my optimism. One is is this um, is a sense of history. The, you know, the more the more I think about the future, the more I read about history, the more I know about the history, the more I'm convinced that um, progress is real. Right. So so progress is real, and um, all the ingredients that we have for progress are still present. So statistically, it's going to continue. The progress will continue. It could stop tomorrow, but it's just it's just unlikely to because all the ingredients for progress in the past are still present going forward. So progress, but then the, but, um, and that's again, a global average. That's the sort of on, on average, doesn't mean that everywhere there's obviously places in the world like Ukraine, that's probably going to have a really, really couple of bad years coming up. You know, it's like, yeah, you can't be optimistic about that. And so, um, the second, the second source of my optimism is, is, um, Going back to this idea that that um, of of trust, of trusting strangers, and I think what optimism you're doing is you're kind of stretch, you're you're trusting the future. You're trusting that um, our um, it's not that our problems are fewer and smaller than we think they are. It's that our capacity to solve problems is greater than we thought, and probably in increasing faster than our our, our abilities to make problems. So so if we can create one percent more than we destroy every year that one percent difference even if a half a percent difference is compounded over time and that's sort of where the optimism comes is that we can compounded interest compounded benefits so even even a tiny one percent a half percent difference which is not visible you can't see right. it you look around and you see 
you see all this crap and terrible and harm and stuff. But all we need is 1% more good than bad. And that 1% is sufficient over time. So yeah, um, I, I, I can easily agree to the, to, to, to the huge amount of, of terrible stuff in the world. But all I need is, is 1% more good and I can be optimistic. Yeah, I guess that's interesting. And I, I wonder, because on the one hand, you see all the progress in biotech, genomics, alternative energy, AI, robotics, and on and on. I could go on and on. And I wonder if it gets disconnected, from, at least in my head, from, oh, they're going to raise interest rates so high that everybody's going to go broke, there's going to be a depression, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how to connect the two like I normally would. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, you know... If, 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 uh, one thing is, is that, is that, um, bad news happens faster than good news. The bad happens fast. Good takes time. Yeah. And part of another way to be optimistic, another reason I'm optimistic is, is to take in the long view, either in the past as well as the future. So, so if we, if, if, uh, but by nature, media news is about bad stuff because that is, that's what happens on the short term is mostly bad. Good stuff takes a longer time to happen. So if the headlines could, if you can only read headlines or make headlines every hundred years, instead of the last five minutes, the headlines would be completely different. They'd all be good news. <laughs> you know, um, lifespans up, security increases, um, you know, uh, violent deaths are, 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 are decreasing. And so, <clears throat> and so the nature, the nature of, of news in general, no matter where it's source, is, is that it's going to report on the bad thing that's happened in the last 12 hours because the good stuff doesn't happen at that speed. And so you, if you, when, as you take a longer and longer view, if you start to think generationally about how to be a good ancestor um, and, and, and you elevate it, that elevated horizon can accommodate all kinds of fairly major setbacks and disasters because in the longer term, they don't matter as much. They can be the good compounding good of a few percent a year can actually overcome those, those kinds of setbacks. I, I, I love uh, the, the advice in your book, uh, to be a good ancestor, plant a tree. Yeah. Well, that, that exemplifies what you're saying. Like a tree will ultimately be a huge part of any ecosystem, right? But it takes a long time. It's not going to make a headline. Kevin Kelly planted a tree, <laughs> right? So yeah. So so when I <clears throat> when I was seventeen, I lived. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and I in a backyard. We're in New Jersey, in Western New Jersey, and I planted a um, a, 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 a I found a seedling, a little seedling that had spread it from the acorn. The acorn was still attached to it, and I planted it in our backyard. And I said, I want to come back here in 50 years and see a big tree. And I had my 50th high school reunion last year and I went back and the tree was there and it was this huge hundred foot oak tree that I planted when I was wow. 17. Hundred foot. Hundred foot. It was just, yes, it was, it was beautiful. And, um, you know, the old saying, the best time to plant a tree was <laughs> 50 years ago. The second best time is today. So, um, we want to think generationally, uh, and when you do that, you can become more optimistic. And that force, yeah, that's and true. that's in thinking about the future and trying to make a, a future that we want to live in requires us to imagine it. It's not going to happen accidentally, inadvertently. We're not going to have a great set of technologies that work in the future and, and a kind of a, a social system accidentally. We have to kind of imagine it first and the future is built by people who believe that it's possible to make it. And that act of autism ma makes, means that, you know, the future is into present is actually shaped by optimists. What, what, um, what else happened at your 50th high school reunion? Like, were you glad you went? <laughs> yeah. What did you uh, learn? Uh, so, so, um, the surprise to me, and this was a, so this is a self-selected, set of people, but surprised to me was the number of people who had never left the area. Because, mm -hmm. Of course, that is self-selecting because they're more likely to come to the reunion. Um, 
So, so that was one thing. And the other thing, the, the thing that I did, I, I gave myself a little assignment. It says, I want to talk to, I had a class of almost a thousand. I want to talk to all the, the people, all the kids that I never spoke to in my class. And I didn't even know were, were in my class. And so that was my assignment was to, it was not talking to my close friends, but to, to kind of meet <laughs> classmates that I went through high school with and never, once had a conversation with. And that was great because there were a bunch of people who went very different paths than I do. You know, this was, I graduated in 1970. There was a guy who joined the military, joined the army voluntarily. It's like, what? <laughs> this is like Vietnam War is going on. It's crazy. But anyway, his life was very, you know, it was very interesting. He, he eventually became a pilot and then a traffic controller and it's like there was an entire world that I didn't know anything about. So for me, that was the joy. And that, and that's, you know, remind just in general, I find you're a very curious person. You learn, you, tr it seems like you try to learn from everybody and every experience around you. And I, I really admire that. I, I try to do that myself, but you're, you're very successful at that. And, you know, you know, one thing you say and, and, I think this is one of the most powerful pieces of advice you have is when someone is nasty or mean to you, assume they have a disease. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, and that makes you it's caused by a disease. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 or actually don't assume they have, but, but treat it as if it was a disease is, is how I say it. I mean, I don't, because right, it allows you to have sympathy instead of right. anger for them. Right. Right. Just, just assume that there's a little bit like, well, maybe they can't help it. There's some reason for it there. If, if I sat down, maybe I'd understand it and, and it'd be kind of like not justified, but at least understandable. And so I find that easier to say, well, somebody's kind of really, really nasty. It's like, oh, they have a brain tumor. <laughs> you know, it's like, because actually that happened. That was based on, on something that happened when I was in high school was a, a, a girl in my class, her dad became really, really terrible. And then he suddenly died and they on top of discovered he had this really huge brain tumor. It was like, ah, uh. ah, okay. What if we all knew that we, we would have been a little bit more forgiving, you know, working with that, that would have been a huge difference. And so now I just like, I just, uh, I'll kind of go forward and say, yeah, you know, they have a brain tumor. But let me ask you a question. Like you're such a revered person in, in, you know, anybody who knows you and anybody who knows your work, when was the last time someone was nasty to you? Someone you knew? Someone that I knew. Oh, uh, well, okay. I, I have a relative who got very, very upset. I mean, it's a very complicated story. Um, yeah, very, very angry at, at me for something that I was trying to do in, in their, in their lives. And, um, uh, so we, you know, we had a cooling off period that helped a lot. And, um, uh, I just, so, so yeah, I, I treated as if something that there was a reason that there was a reason behind it. That I didn't know about that. I'm going to assume I'll find out later. Um, and the, the, the answer was to, to, um, to cool, to cool down. And then I saw him recently and we were, it was perfectly fine. He was in much better spirits. The thing that was causing this kind of conflict hadn't really been resolved, but it had been, what's the word I want, um, accommodated. So, so rather than kind of escalating things, yeah, we, 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 we kind of like how you de-escalate it. And um, there is a little bit of kind of like trying to empathy. It's, it's, a, it's a form of empathy, really, of, of you're trying to say, well, I don't even know what it is, but I know that there's probably, again, there's, we didn't have that three level conversation. That would have been really good, but that was something that was not going to happen at that time. Hmm. So I just assume that if we got down to the third level, that, that there would be something that would be helpful. Uh, that's a, that's a good piece of advice too to assume yeah. there's a third level, right? Right. <laughs> like basically, every mine has gold at the bottom in there somewhere. Right. Right. It's, so, so one of the pieces of advice is I think that we we only see two percent 
of the other person. And they only see 2% of us. And you have to kind of uh, just account for the fact that there's 98% of something going on that you're not aware of. Yeah. And that's just my, my default stance is like, yeah, yeah, you, you know, there's James, there's, you see 2% of me and there's 98% that you're not seeing that's going on behind me, whatever it is. And that's just my assumption. And so um, you have to kind of a calculate in that, in that form. Well, for part of the other 98%, though, we do have your book, Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier, which is an important subtitle, by the way, yeah. because I, I believe everybody says, oh, I never regret anything. I do believe in regrets, and I wish I had some more wisdom when yeah. I was younger, but thankfully now I have your book, Excellent Advice for Living. And by the way, just general advice books are usually pretty bad, Yeah, but your advice is as you as you could point out is is generational like your thousand true fans is gonna that advice is gonna live forever your be, be don't be the best be the only this is gonna live forever so much of your advice in this book i mean i started just you know bookmarking almost every page but it's it's a beautiful book it's beautiful advice it's really worth thinking about and i i super enjoyed this this conversation. It's almost like I treated this as a private therapy. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I really enjoyed our conversation and we're having so much fun that I realized that I actually overstayed my, my time and I have to run right now to my next one. Sorry, but um, go, go run. Again. I did. I did want to ask you advice, but I'll do it some other time. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, thanks again. I really had a blast as usual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks so much for coming back on. Talk Alrighty. to you soon. Bye-bye.